there has been a murder. Body positivity, the radical movement that dared to suggest people should be treated with dignity regardless of their weight or appearance, has been found dead in an alley. And when I say dead, I mean f mutilated. You can't even recognize that anymore. Who is responsible for this? It could be any one of us. Maybe even all of us. Today we're going to have a look back at BP's history and figure out how such a heinous act could have occurred. Now I've heard that the death of a movement that was supposed to help a lot of people who really needed it could be, uh, kind of a sensitive topic. So we're going to do our best to handle this with the respect and deference it deserves. What the hell was that? Body positivity, in its modern form, began in the 1960s as the Fat Acceptance Movement. This movement was less about feeling good about yourself and more focused on ending discrimination against fat people. How do people discriminate against fat people? Well, let's see. They're less likely to get hired for jobs. If they are hired, they have a harder time getting raises or promotions. They're asked to pay higher insurance premiums, if they can get health insurance at all. Doctors are more likely to tell a fat person to lose weight when they have a problem than perform thorough diagnostics. Healthcare professionals often humiliate or make disparaging comments to obese patients. Teachers expect less of fat children and may even make rude comments about them in front of their classmates. And college universities are less likely to admit students who are overweight. And that's just a few examples. The common rebuttal to these complaints is that people can just stop being fat. It's their fault after all. But is it? First off, the perception of what is fat in America is very skewed. A woman's average size is between 14 and 18, and yet this is labeled as plus size in the fashion industry. So already, Americans are willing to label someone as fat or plus size, even if they meet the average size. But taking that aside, even if you were in a group that considers that fat, the truth about body weight is that many people have very little control over it. What causes obesity? A better question might be, what doesn't? Genetics is a common cause, so good luck preventing that one. There's also a condition known as insulin resistance, which is very common in America thanks to the typical Western diet. Unless you're a leftist, of course, in which case you're surely eating nothing but soy and will be A-OK. -okay. Various types of medication, including antidepressants. You know what makes people depressed? Being discriminated against for being obese. So that's a great cycle. Certain types of asthma medication are another culprit. Yeah, think about that one. Kid has a hard time exercising and takes a drug that increases weight. But hey, guess he should have known better. I could go on, but I think you get the idea. Obesity is not the clear-cut cause and effect it is often perceived to be. And you know what? Even if it was purely caused by overeating alone, what difference does that make? Does this person still deserve to be dehumanized? Society seems to think so, but society also seems to have an invested interest in keeping people obese. There was once a time when we could advertise cookies as breakfast and use sugar as a selling point. Then the health awareness movement started and these companies realized they had to be craftier. Sugary and fattening foods are addictive, and the people selling them know that. They purposely use ads that appeal to your senses and associate the food with good times. Coke is one of the most egregious offenders. Have you ever gone two weeks without a soda? If you're drinking water the whole time, you'll probably find that soda tastes kind of disgusting when you try drinking it again. It might even make you feel sick. Now I'm not telling you not to drink a soda if you want it, or that you should be ashamed for liking it. Life is short, and if you like soda, drink a f***ing soda, and don't let anyone make you feel shitty about it. What I'm trying to say is that Coke has a vested interest in making you drink as much soda as possible without taking a break because they know it's nothing but addictive, sugary garbage. What is a typical Coke advertisement? You'll usually see a bunch of people outside, hanging out, laughing, acting like life is so f***ing amazing. And hey, just so happens they're drinking a Coke! Maybe if I drank coke, I would feel happy. Maybe I'll finally have friends. If... If only I had been drinking coke in high school, maybe I wouldn't have been caught in the relentless vice grip of anxiety and depression as I contemplated how lonely we all are on an existential level, or dwell on the fact that no matter how many people I surround myself with or how many beach trips I take, I'm going to die alone. Taste the happiness? Taste the happiness? Fuck you, coke! Fuck you! Or think about the opening cinematic you'll see at a movie theater. They often show a close-up of a coke being poured into a cup accompanied by a very pleasing sizzling sound. That's just straight up them trying to create a craving for an addictive substance. If we as a society are okay with companies doing whatever they can to make people eat unhealthy food, then why are we so discriminatory against fat people? Because it creates a false sense of superiority. A person might see a fat person and think, well they made their choices, but I made my perfectly healthy ones. So not saying I'm better than them, but... This attitude totally discounts the fact that we have no idea what circumstances people deal with. 
I myself eat kind of like crap, but I was born with the privilege of an efficient metabolism. I can be as unhealthy as I want and no one knows the difference. Because the truth is, people aren't really upset that someone is unhealthy. We are told pretty much from the time we are born that fat people are lesser. When someone needs an example of a sloth-like, lazy person that is antithetical to what we should be, they will have no problem using children as their example. I have seen, I have seen uh, and studied and analyzed uh, all types of security threats. I fought in several wars. Uh, but there's an emerging threat that we're seeing, and I'd like to talk a little bit about today, um, that I think will have an effect on our future, our economy, our youth, and our economic system. And it is an emerging threat that concerns me significantly. And it's represented in this picture. Oh my God! Now you might think, why is a soldier talking about uh, a young man who is obviously inactive and perhaps is a little bit overweight? And it's because of some things I've seen in the last several years, uh, and I'd like to talk a little bit about those today and relate it to how I believe it could be a national security threat within the next 20 to 30 years. It's okay though, guys. It's not because we hate those kids. We're just worried about their health and well-being. Surely the best solution is to burden them with guilt and shame until they feel so bad about themselves that they lose weight. After all, they deserve to be treated worse because they didn't try hard enough to be thin. And thin people are perfect. Part 2. How Fat Activism Became Body Positivity Fat activism was much like any other movement to end discrimination. People were staging protests and doing their best to raise awareness about the prejudice against them and their loved ones. As more people became aware of the movement, the narrative started to shift. It's hard to say where it happened exactly, but somewhere along the way, body positivity just sort of mitosis off from fat activism and became its own thing. Some people attribute the founding of the movement to Connie Sobchak and Elizabeth Scott, who founded thebodypositive.org in 1996. On their website's FAQ page, they mention that they, along with Deb Bugard, who started her own body positivity site, which has been living like it's 1999 for the past 20 years, used the term during the 90s. There are also some AIDS organizations using it to support people who are HIV positive. Different from fat activism, body positivity is more inclusive. Encourage anyone who struggles with self-esteem and body issues to speak up. Bodypositive.org itself was founded specifically in response to eating disorders, but its overall mission is broader, teaching people how to be happy and comfortable with their bodies in a society that worships models and celebrities. While these were important topics that needed to be addressed, the shift in focus had some drawbacks. You don't hear a lot about fat activism these days, and that's due in part because body positivity pretty much took over. Everyone wants to feel like they're part of something, and suddenly anyone who had ever had even one negative thought about their body believed that this movement applied to them, and thus a million million hashtags were born. But awareness is good, right? Typically yes, but unfortunately the term body positivity is kind of vague. In a survey conducted by the app Whisper, 35% of respondents defined body positivity as being okay with flaws. 29% said it was about loving yourself. 21% claimed it was all about being confident. And 15% defined it as appreciating your body. On the surface, these might all sound pretty similar, but Whisper had some follow-up questions which show how differently people can interpret this topic. When asked how people can enact body positivity, 16% said by inspiring others. 18% said eating healthy and fitness, so back on the health obsession. 26% said by telling yourself you're awesome, kind of basic, but whatever. And the most popular answer at 40% was by wearing great clothes. <sighs> I mean, I get it, but also there's a lot of possible complications there. There's a lot of confusion around what body positivity actually means. And although it may not sound like a big deal, this ambiguous definition has led to a mutation of the original purpose. When asked how someone can be body positive by psychology today, Connie Sobchak said, To be body positive, it is important to assume responsibility for figuring out what your body needs. In many ways, this feels harder than having an external expert voice tell you what to eat and how to move. Be willing to trust your ability to know what feels good for your unique body, learn from trial and error, and be kind to yourself when you make mistakes. In that same article, Mallory Dunn, the founder of a body positivity fashion line, talked about some of the major ways people misinterpret body positivity. One major misconception about body positivity is that it involves feeling incredible in your skin every moment of the day. But body positivity isn't about forcing yourself to feel beautiful and wonderful 24-7. You don't have to adore every aspect of your appearance to be body positive. You just have to divorce that appearance, and your feelings about it, 
from how you evaluate your worth as a person. What you look like should not have any bearing on your decision to be kind to and love yourself and others. Body positivity has garnered criticism because a lot of people subscribe to the love yourself all the time definition, but that's not what it was ever intended to be. Ideally, a person who participates in body positivity would get to a point where they aren't thinking about their appearance on a daily basis, and when instances occur when they're forced to think about it, they'll have strategies and a solid foundation of self-esteem to handle them without feeling stressed or hating themselves. Part 3, where we waste several minutes discussing the dumbest objection to body positivity. Alright, so let's go ahead and get this out of the way. Heart disease is the number one cause of death for men and women worldwide. Medical professionals say people who are obese are more likely to develop heart disease. And yeah, it's true that obesity is linked to many health problems. Uh, however, that doesn't mean that someone who is fat is unhealthy, just like someone who is skinny is not necessarily healthy. Many of the health conditions linked to obesity also say that stress and depression can be a contributing factor. You know what stresses people out? Being discriminated against. You know what a lot of people do when they're stressed? Find unhealthy ways to cope, like over or under eating, smoking, drinking, taking drugs, etc. Unfortunately, doctors still use obesity as an excuse to trivialize the medical issues of men and women by simply telling them that they need to lose weight every time they have a problem. This leads to misdiagnoses and is a pretty serious form of malpractice that goes largely ignored. Neither body positivity nor fat acceptance are telling people not to be healthy. They're encouraging people to learn how to be comfortable with their bodies and figure out what's right for them. It's different for everyone. Continuing Mallory Dunn's answer from earlier, she tells us that another misconception is the assumption that championing body positivity equates to telling people to be unhealthy or to stop taking care of themselves. On the one hand, that's not what it's doing. It's telling you to be okay with yourself. There's ample research that if you hate yourself, you're not going to take care of yourself. Studies show you have to care about yourself in order to take charge of your health and well-being. On the other hand, other people's health is nobody's business but their own. If someone is being unhealthy in a way you deem inappropriate, that's not your concern. It's their body. It's called autonomy. Some people have a problem with this way of thinking because it means doctors will have to take care of fat people who chose to be unhealthy, which we don't even have free health care in America, so what do you care? And second, no one is going to say anything to the skinny guy who ate nothing but salty food his whole life and is having a stroke. One thing everyone needs to keep in mind is that health is not a moral virtue. You don't hear people blaming cancer patients for having cancer, and why not? You can look up all the things that contain carcinogens. It's easy to avoid if you're diligent, and yet all those valuable hospital resources are being used on their chemotherapy. I'm just so, so angry. I've got so much pent-up energy now. I'm going to go to a hospital and scream right in a cancer patient's face. Maybe a kid. Yeah, little brat couldn't even wait until he was old to get cancer. Lazy, selfish little monster. Part 4. The answer to this video is that capitalism ruined it. Oh, our dear fallen friend, body positivity. What began as a very pure and motivating campaign was eventually usurped by mysterious forces that twisted its meaning into an all-inclusive hashtag that could be marketed and sold. At first, body positivity language was used by larger women, disabled people, and people of color who had been made to feel shamed about their bodies. Then, when it started trending, conventionally attractive white women started using it to promote themselves and larger women started to get marginalized in a movement that was supposed to be about them. I'm not trying to demonize those women. Women as a whole are made to feel very aware of their bodies and the pressure to be beautiful is felt by everyone. But the problem is that when conventionally attractive women started using it, the plus size people started getting edged out. Bethany Rudder of Days refers to this as socially acceptable body positivity. Once thin women applied body positivity to themselves, people felt comfortable demonizing fat people once again for not being healthy enough. Worse still, once the good old capitalists found out that body positivity was trending amongst millennials, they wasted no time turning it into cash. You'll find body positivity skincare products, diet plans, jeans, and just about anything else that someone can sell you to make you feel beautiful. Even the Kardashians are trying to claim they're body positive, and apparently there are still people in the world who care about them? I, I mean, who, who even are these people? I, I, I don't get it. Why are they famous? Someone explain it to me. Or don't, because I'm sure the answer is stupid. But it's not just products that are being sold. Companies are using body positivity to market their brand and prove themselves an ally to people with body issues. In her paper, The Commodification of the Body Positive Movement on Instagram, Jessica Huyner Horta writes, The information of user activity has become commodified and sold to advertisers in order for them to better direct advertisements at specific audiences. Marketers collect consumer data and track the brands and channels consumers prefer. Instagram revealed an hour-by-hour -hour breakdown of when its users are on 
on the platform and when consumers are engaging with content, allowing marketers to know the best times of day to share a message on the visual platform. Targeting criteria on Instagram allows advertisers to get their products or services in front of exactly the right people at the right time. The commodification doesn't stop there. Once a company has convincingly portrayed itself as body positive, the consumer will then buy the product and post about it on their own social media accounts with all the relevant hashtags, thus driving up awareness of the product, the brand, and the company as a whole. These companies have effectively used women with body and self-esteem issues to market their products without paying them. But hey, brand influencers benefit too, right? If they get popular enough, they can get paid advertising deals or get invited to interviews or write a book or whatever the f***. Companies will even start giving them free products along with branding guidelines, ensuring that the influencer doesn't do or say anything that conflicts with the company's image. They are teaching these influencers how to present themselves to the world in order to gain more followers, and effectively transforming them from an individual into a walking, talking billboard. Not every influencer falls prey to that, though, right? I've heard of this one body-positive influencer, Robbie Tripp, who proudly says that he refuses to sell out. Oh look, he even made a music video. I am sure it is done with the same taste and class you would expect from any man who claims to be a spokesperson for body positivity. Let's check it out. This jam is dedicated to all the curvy queens out there. Just living your best life, girl, you deserve that. And you deserve an anthem. Because there's a lot of terms out there to describe all your beautiful curvilicious ladies. My girl chubby sexy Okay, so that is not body positivity. That's just the same objectification of women we've always had, only now the subjects are larger than the conventionally attractive model. Robbie Tripp got famous because he posted a picture on Instagram where he's hugging his wife and wrote a whole thing about how he's always loved larger women, and for some reason that caused a stir. Now he heralds himself as a champion of body positivity, although his version of body positivity seems to be saying, hey guys, don't be ashamed of yourself for objectifying big women. Big women are sexy too, because that's just what this movie needed. Some dude telling everyone that more men need to apply the male gaze to plus-sized women. Once men have accepted that fat women are hot, discrimination will be solved! All of a woman's self-esteem problems definitely stem from the fact that a man has not yet told her she's beautiful. I don't want to villainize Robbie Tripp. After all, he'll swear up and down that what he's doing isn't objectification. Say, like, what would you say to people that would be like, you know, he's a man, he doesn't have any right to talk about, like, women's bodies or like, you know, he's objectifying curvy women and stuff like that. Like, what would, what would your response be? I mean, people like what they like. There's nothing wrong with liking curvy women, but at the same time, it's like you can see it for what it is or you can take it and try and make it into something negative when it's not. <laughs> but that's why it's frustrating when like, we do, we're doing things like this and it's inevitable it's gonna come out when we release this music video is like people telling me like, I'm objectifying like curvy women or stuff like that. But it's the complete opposite. It's just like, I'm showing you that there's a complete different standard of beauty and that society is not recognizing that. Like, mm -hmm. curvy women are beautiful, they're gorgeous, they're strong, like, you know what I mean? And they, they need to be represented. And so, you know, I've, I've been dealing with haters my whole entire life, and so I'm, I'm welcome in. And, and well, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't think people understand. It had, to be, it had to be someone like you it's in like, order to be able to stand up. To, yeah. I, I, and I don't, I'm not even saying that as a joke. I will say this, like, for every hater who's gonna say, like, that's too much, this is objectifying or something like that, there's gonna be a hundred curvy girls who are like, that's me, yeah. that's awesome. And I feel represented. I love my body, yeah. yeah, I feel represented, like that's what we do it for. But this is done to celebrate curvy women. This is not done to sexualize curvy women. This is to show that curvy women can be sexy. Sexy, not sexual. Don't get it twisted, okay? I'm not saying that he's an evil person or even that his intentions are bad, but he is completely and seemingly willfully unaware of how his egocentric approach to this movement is doing more harm than good. In the article, The Fragility of Body Positivity, Yvette Dion writes, 
Through his declaration, as well as the media's coverage, their love was depicted as an anomaly, rooted in the idea that plus-sized people are starved of love so any form of affection is worth celebrating. The body-positive media economy centers these affirming, empowering, let-me-pinch-a-fat role to show how much I love myself stories while failing to actually challenge institutions to stop discriminating against fat people. A lot of women have told Robbie Tripp that his very publicized attraction to his wife has made them feel better about themselves, or believe it when people tell them that they're beautiful. What he's doing isn't all bad, but the solution he's providing is more like a band-aid than legitimate treatment. Over the last 15 years or so, lots of well-meaning people and companies have worked to improve women's body image by pushing the message that all women are beautiful, flaws and all. This is a really nice message, but it isn't fixing the problem. That's because girls and women aren't only suffering because of the unattainable ways beauty is being defined. They are suffering because they are being defined by beauty. They are bodies first and people second. So rather than working to make sure more women's bodies are viewed as valuable, we are focused on making sure women are valued as more than bodies to view. Robbie's video speaks to a larger problem stemming from the commodification of body positivity. The women used to represent body positivity are still being presented with traditional feminine beauty standards. You have the makeup, the high heels, the long flowing hair, the emphasis on breasts and ass. There's nothing wrong with this in and of itself. Everyone should be free to present themselves the way they want to. But the problem is this version is often presented as the only definition of feminine beauty, and it's being used to sell things. Brands that have begun including plus-size models into their advertising campaigns and have launched plus-size clothes for larger women use models such as Ashley Graham who is closer to the normative ideal body. Body positive advocates are disgruntled by this change because it does not accurately represent a variety of larger sized women. Not to mention that these companies often rely on Photoshop to remove cellulite, stretch marks, and other imperfections. The representation of plus-size women who are just outside of the beauty ideal once again ignore the experiences of larger bodies, rendering them invisible. I found this post from Robbie Tripp in an article claiming that the one good opinion Robbie has is that it's your job as a significant other to capture your partner's beauty, and you'd better be willing to take 100 photos to get it done. Oh boy, I'm going to have to, I'm going to, have to read this out loud, aren't I? <sighs> All right. Attention all boyfriends, husbands, significant others. It's 2019 and your girl deserves a fire shot for her Instagram. She's a queen and you're the only one who's responsible for capturing her beauty. So you better wake up. If you don't know her best angles and aren't willing to take the bare minimum 100 photos before you get the one, then you need to man up and get with the program, my friend. It's a new year, and I don't want to see any more of you out there holding your girl's phone in one hand like a dead fish, rolling your eyes like you'd rather be doing anything else, like, you know, reading a book or talking to her, taking four damn photos and then handing her phone back to her just like you did her a big favor. What a joke factory. She deserves better than that. You are better than that, my man. Take pride in yourself, your girl her Instagram, and step up your photo game. Get down on the ground, scrape your knees on the cement, and tap on that screen 700 times until your thumb snaps off to get that shot. And you'd better be happy about doing it, because if you keep taking trash photos with a yucky attitude, then not only is your girl going to have a stale Instagram game, but she's definitely not going to chuck the booty at you tonight. And that's just bad for everyone involved. If you're not googling the best lighting for that time of day, positioning her just right so the light hits her left ass cheek perfectly, <sighs> and then scrolling through hundreds of photos to find the best one to edit through a premium lighting app, then you're slacking, my man. It's 2019. Oh, thanks for reminding me again. Uh, your girl needs you. I believe in you. Go out there and make it happen. Sincerely your friend, Robbie Tripp. Explosion, tag a guy who needs to hear this. Well, I, I can only think of one person, honestly. So here's a philosophical question for you. If a woman is beautiful and there's not a man around to take 100 pictures of her, is she still beautiful? 
Robbie got a lot of attention after making his initial Instagram post. He has since leaned into the popularity it gave him and consistently uses his wife as a means to promote himself. He has commodified her and their relationship to fuel his own reputation. I'm not making any comment about their relationship or if their love is real or not. They may very well be happy with this arrangement, and if it works for them, then whatever. But like it or not, this is objectification, and you should not try to sell it as body positivity. If you need to take 100 photos of someone to get the beautiful one, are you really appreciating their real, authentic beauty? This implies that someone in their natural, candid state is not beautiful. You need to modify the angle, the lighting, the way they stand, their expression, and so much more to capture the image that you and all the world can agree is beautiful. This mentality continues to put pressure on people to be what other people would consider attractive. If you want to be accepted by society, if you want to be a face that can sell products and influence people, you'd better conform to a certain standard. The people who are most meant to benefit from body positivity and fat activism have been edged out of the movement. Fat people are still discriminated against, and body positivity has been redefined into a more traditional, capitalist-friendly format. This is why many people are distancing themselves from the movement, and it's a real tragedy, because now that they've had a movement that's been usurped, how are they going to get anyone to listen to them without immediately being dismissed as cynics? Body positivity is everywhere! What are you complaining about? The people who started the bodypositive.org did a very important thing. They gave power back to a group that felt so much pressure to live up to society's standards that they thought hurting themselves was the only way they could measure up. Now the movement has devolved into commodification and shameless self-promotion. And I won't lie, I've participated in it. Like many people, I had subconsciously subscribed to the belief that body positivity was just a buzzword. I don't know if we can undo what's been done, but we don't have to add to it. I strongly encourage you to check out the resources in the description as there are a lot of people out there who have more meaningful things to say about it than I do. This video is very broad and is a very watered down version of information that is already out there. It also has way too much Robbie Tripp in it. I'm sorry, I, I just couldn't help myself. He's like a car crash I can't stop looking at. Do not be like me, he does not deserve that much attention, but that's besides the point. In short, you don't have to become a body positivity activist, but at the very least, let's not all contribute to the further mutilation of a very important campaign. All right, way to go. You made it to the end. Woohoo, we, we, we did it. We are all here. Go us. Uh, thanks for watching. If you got something valuable out of this video and think others could too, please consider giving it a like. Comments are also appreciated for the most part. Just don't be horrible. And you know, if you, if you like this stuff, if you like what I'm saying and might want to hear other things, then consider hitting that subscribe button. But other than that, we're done. Yeah, uh, I, I don't know how to close these things. It's not good. Uh, you know what? Here's a, here's a Coke commercial, because those are fun. You know, this was me five years ago, and it's still me. But I confess, I'm a waistline watcher from way back. Well, that's enough for today. Now for a lively lift. Ice cold Coca Cola. There's no waistline worry with Coke, you know. Actually, this individual size bottle has no more calories than half a grapefruit. Mmm, another thing, the cold, crisp taste of Coke is so satisfying, it keeps me from eating something else that might really add those pounds. Coke's a natural, wholesome blending of pure food flavors. I guess that's why everyone likes the refreshing new feeling you get, only from not too sweet Coca Cola. And no wonder, lively, lifty Coca-Cola provides a welcome bit of quick energy between meals. Thanks for a pleasant pause in a busy day. Oh, and remember, Coke is low in calories, too. Say, now, don't you get any thinner.